Your Excellency, we appreciate you staying with us for this additional time, and, and we hope the discussion this afternoon will be fruitful. At this time, I would like to invite CNBC Africa presenter Bonnie Tunya to the, to the podium, who will be your moderator for the next session. It's been a pleasure serving as your MC this afternoon. I thank you for your kind attention, and I wish you a successful conference. The fact that there is already something that is happening, but are we happy with the quality? And if indeed, what then should be our yardstick for measuring the quality of this very education we talk about? In a sense of opening remarks, I'd like to first uh, introduce, in no particular order, uh, Dr. Price uh, from the University of Cape Town. Uh, just give us a sense of what you make of this question of the quality of, the, of tertiary education on the continent and basing it on your experience. Thank you. Well, in several of the introductory speeches in the previous session, uh, one could assume that quality was being measured by how universities perform in the rankings. And therefore, they were being telling us over and over, quality is poor. On the continent as a whole, some, less, some 10 un Afri universities from Africa in the top 1,000, and about half of them are in South Africa and half of them in, in Egypt. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time uh, worrying or, or debating the quality is poor. I do want to say something, though, about why I think the rankings is a particularly iniquitous and inappropriate way to measure quality and why I would not align myself with the call to have 25 or 30 universities in the top 200 or 300 because it gives a credit and a legitimacy to that ranking system which I think is really problematic. So you might be surprised that that is coming from me, from the University of Cape Town, which is ranked number one uh, in the continent and has been on most of the ranking systems. But in a sense, that's what gives me the permission to say this, whereas anyone else saying this would be accused of sour grapes because they were not at number one. Well, what is it about the rankings and why am I so critical? There's lots of critiques and they have to do with the indicators used and how they're judged. But the most important thing is that it is an ordinal ranking. In other words, for you to go up, someone else has to go down. Families can't afford to pay fees, you know, uh, most, most families. Uh, private sector institutions, banks are charging 30 to 40 percent interest rates. And philanthropy is limited in terms of how, how, how it can, the scale it can reach. So we've created something called the income sharing arrangements, where we set up a finance company. It's called African Leadership Finance Corporation that actually attracts capital from investors, and then that capital finances the student's education. And then when the student graduates, it's not a loan that they have to pay with interest, but rather they share a percentage of their income back with the finance company. So they share 10% of their income for 10 years, and then they're done. <coughs> so if they're unemployed, they don't have to pay anything. If you're working in a low-paying job, you're paying just a percentage. If you're working in a high-paying job, you're also paying a percentage. So what we're saying is that <coughs> African students don't have the financing for their education today, but they will when they get a job. And so let them pay for their education after the fact. And Australia has done this on the national level, and, and, and today it finances about 30% of their higher education budget. So this, would, I believe, is a way in which higher education can be made very accessible by re giving returns to investors, <coughs> universities get their revenue, and student gets a free or reduced cost education. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I got your question uh, completely right, but um, let me tell you what, how I see the issue of quality of tertiary education. And there are a number of ways to interpret or how, uh, define the quality of education in, in university. But I think the biggest testimony of good quality education in, in university is how uh, the graduates can find jobs, the uh, employability of the graduates. And um, the issues that we have had in uh, Tunisia, the Arab Spring, is a testimony that the, perhaps uh, there is a mismatch between what is demanded by the private sector and what is supplied by the universities. So one hypothetical way of um, giving an answer to this uh, complex question, somewhat simplified answer, would be to make ed uh, university education more practical-oriented, 
problem-solving sol oriented one rather than theoretical or um, academic ones. Well, uh, to, um, I'm making a very simplified discussion, but maybe making the educational system more engineered, geared toward the needs of the, the private sector and the community of African countries is the key. And how can we do that? Well, there is no panacea for this uh, challenging, uh, challenging task, but we have some experiences working together with some African counterparts, like the Jomo Kenya at the University of uh, Agriculture and Technology, the vice chancellor of which is going to talk about this afternoon later. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, efforts to uh, uh, change the way that a, a university education is uh, provided time. The Carnegie Mellon University is the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, it's African Leadership University, and a couple of other centers of excellence which has been set up here. So uh, looking at the, from the policy issue and the prospect which comes with these institutions either from the region or from the global coming to, to set the shop here and the potential of amount of innovation and creativity which are coming from these centers, I think that's one of the factors which has been contributing. Uh, at least Rwanda to rise, to, to be ranked highly, uh, because there is that high level of uh, political will and commitment and significant investment. Seminars that are globalized, this was not possible five years ago. This is where the leapfrogging can come in. We have to really be creative in opening up how the teaching is done, how the information is done, how the seminars are organized, who's a professor at what school, because now you can be virtually teaching anywhere. Right. That's really important. So I think the rankings, I want to put it aside a little bit. It's going to take care of itself because rankings that are old fashioned and backward looking, no one's going to look at anyway. The rankings themselves are going to change. But what is true is that excellence of education is a real thing. That's not a mirage. That's a real thing. Right. And so that we need to, to work on. And I think we, if we're creative, we can find all sorts of ways to open the channels for partnerships, for faculty exchanges, for broader curricula, for really leapfrogging. Um, from what I understand from the panel uh, discussion, what you are describing as a need, a requirement, or perhaps even an imperative for uh, the universities in Africa to be an agent of uh, sustainable development would require a revolution, liberation of the mind. Because if it is true that we have a tremendous opportunities, as uh, described by Fred Swaninka, to create a, a lot kind of ways we want to see our university going, but we have also what he said, we are stuck in our legacy. Who is going to create the models we want? Because one reality of the higher education system is also, this is a place where conservatism is in abundance. So who are going to be the agent who revolutionize, if I can say, right. the university? Thank you. Thank you. And probably uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Price respond to the question. And then uh, Fred, if you have a, a comment on her issue of who will lead this revolution. And then I'll come to uh, one last round. OK? Mr. Price. Uh, I completely agree with the questioner. Um, that we very often assume quality is just the number of publications and that that is leading to all sorts of perverse consequences and is not a measure of quality. Um, there are many uh, attempts to find alternatives and I'll just list three by way of example. I don't think we know which is the best way. But the first, which is in the, U in, in the UK, in the research assessment exercise, is to say to researchers, you can only present five publications. Whether you've done 100 or 200 or seven, you can only present your top five. And we'll only assess you on that. So that it shifts the focus dramatically from quantity to quality. 
Um, the second is to say, around all of your research, you must tell us what the impact is. And the examples you gave of showing that the research productivity, the output of the research appears in WHO policy documents or in government documents or that it's been discussed in a parliamentary committee or that a community has used it. Um, those are measures of impact. It's much harder to, objective, or to do that objectively. It doesn't fit in with ranking systems, etc., easily because it's so different. But I think that's where we should be putting energy. A third is looking why, when one is in a more traditional academic environment, looking at citations, which is commonly done. How many people think that the work you've done is worth quoting? Um, and, and that still is, uh, I think, a reasonably good measure. In all of these things, we need to remember to standardize these across fields. So in some areas, if you're in cell biology and you, you write something, it will be quoted thousands of times. Uh, it will be widely distributed and uh, many other people will use it because the next time someone does a gene experiment they've got to use your, the test that you designed. Um, whereas it may, possibly if you're looking at flooding in a regional community, no one else will, the, will read that and so, or except for the people in that community. And so we have to be careful not to allow those things to become again measures of rankings uh, inappropriately. But I do agree with you strongly that impact should, uh, the impact must be a much stronger measure of quality than it has been. Mrs. Dr. Sonica. And I'd like just to give a minute each to my other four panelists to give your closing comments. Uh, let's start uh, at the very end. Uh, Mr. Toka, coming down. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I'd like to talk a bit about partnership. Uh, despite the less than optimal situation of tertiary education in Africa, I think the opportunities are huge because many countries outside Africa, governments, uh, universities, and international cooperation organizations believe in the bright future of Africa, and the investment in, make, in tertiary education in Africa is worthwhile. Many, people, many organizations believe that way. So in that sense, maybe universities uh, in Africa have an, um, faced with a huge opportunities and partnerships and hundreds and thousands of organizations are offering research grants and scholarships and so opportunities are there. And of course in choosing a partnership, of course you, you tend to uh, think of uh, your traditional partners like Europe and the United States because of your historical relationship as well as their competence in science and technology both in Europe and, and, and the, in the US. But I would like to ask you to look at other possibilities like Asia as, um, because many of the uh, knowledge and experiences acquired in Asian countries, Japan is a little bit uh, early uh, example of development, but Korea, Taiwan, you know, in Southeast Asia, China, and all these countries have ample opportunities to share, ample experiences to share with you, and maybe Latin America too. So I think the, this uh, movement uh, driven by the SDG Center for Africa is, uh, in, in essence, uh, how to, we enlarge and expand the a partnership across the world. And if that is the motive of SDG Center for Africa, my organization will be very happy to contribute our humble contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Price. Um, a, a, a short comment and, and, and a question, really. The comment is that I think uh, it was raised earlier, and I would have put it in my input, that there's some low-hanging fruit with respect to access to electronic databases. And it is iniquitous that uh, in relatively poor countries, we have to pay for something which actually the marginal cost of which is almost zero. Um, and now with the open access movement and the requirement that, which is a good thing of course, it means we can access journals and books without paying. But, but I think we need to think about education as a key, as a prime, as a priority moving forward. Number two, I think we need to think about uh, economies of scale in education. Africa is embarking in this journey of regional integration and all that. It, it doesn't make sense for each and every one of our universities to specialize in everything else. Let us have, for instance, as an example, Rwanda take lead on issues of uh, ICT technology and all that other places, trade, medicine, and, and build economies of scale that will benefit regions and the entire continent. And finally, I think we can benefit a lot from tapping into the huge resources that are available in our diaspora. 
integrating with them, linking with them, and you can innovate here. They can give us part of their uh, leave, take one or two months sabbatical and all that, spend them in the continent. I think this way we can begin to go into the right direction of building our tertiary education and go back to the glory days of McCreary, Abadan, and others. It's doable and we can do it. We've done it before. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Sonica? Um, my closing remarks really just um, a, a, a thought, a reflection. Um, I believe that it's, it's getting faster and faster to develop countries. If you go back and you think about how long it took Europe to develop, uh, it probably would have taken about a thousand years from when they had the levels of poverty that we see in Africa until they reached high income status. The USA started that journey, took them about 300 years. When Japan started that journey, it took them 100 years. Singapore and Korea did it in 60 years. And China has done it in 30 years. Dubai maybe in 15 years. I think at the heart of all this has been two things, education and good leadership. And I believe that we have a unique opportunity, and I'm seeing that here in Rwanda when I just think about what has happened in the last 20 years, to rapidly develop our societies. And there are many things that, are, that we have a disadvantage in, in Africa. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of you know, infrastructure challenges and everything, but the one thing we have is a clean slate. And if we think differently, we have the opportunity to actually take leadership as a continent and create the universities of the future, not just for Africa, but for the world. And if we do this, then it won't take us 100 years to see the levels of prosperity that we need to see on the continent, but it requires different thinking. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you to all my panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure exploring the question of t uh, quality of tertiary education in this SDG era and the Agenda 2063 and trying to find the context in which, as Africa, we find ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pass a special thanks to my panelists, Mr. Hiroshi Kato, Dr. Max Price, Minister uh, Musafiri Malimba, Dr. Abdullah Ham Hamdok, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and Dr. Fred Swanika. Round of applause, please. <clears throat> I would also like to pass a special thanks to our guest of honor, His Excellency the President Paul Kagame, for being part of this conversation. Round of applause, please. <laughs> and so I'd like to ask as you may remain uh, seated as His Excellency takes his leave. Yeah, oh, even better, we can live together. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, for being part of this amazing audience. Thank you. I believe lunch will be served shortly. You'll be guided through. Thank you once again. <laughs>